So hi everyone and welcome to this video on security selection, which is a continuation of our lecture in under the module of investment decisions using the expected utility criteria. So just to recap, in the last video, we discussed the five theorems of Kenneth Arrow, and we said that this has a lot of implication as to how we interpret um, the degree of risk aversion. And it shows the relationship of these, of these particular degrees of risk aversion to the amount that a consumer would be willing to invest in a risky prospect. So uh, now that we have the theories underpinned, one big question to ask is, well, um, how will people or consumers choose specific securities to invest in, right? So what is the security selection criteria? And that's what we're going to sort of pin down in this short, uh, relatively short video. So if you recall the portfolio problem, again, the goal of the portfolio problem is to be able to maximize the expected utility of wealth. And we said that this, uh, this function here was uh, equal to uh, move, uh, is essentially equal to this particular form here, right? So uh, we have here one plus RF, which is your risk-free rate. And you multiply that to uh, a certain wealth, which is W naught. And this will be essentially your risk-free return. Then you have here alpha, which is some uh, amount investable of investable wealth, which you allocate to the risky asset. And you're going to multiply that to its rate of return, which is this one, the difference uh, potentially between the risky rate or the expected rate of return less the risk-free rate. So portfolio choice is limited to allocating the investable wealth W. So if you think about it, you have W not wealth, and you can either put that in a risk-free asset, so uh, completely risk-free, and that pays you a rate of RF, right? Or you could allocate some part of that to a risky prospect, and uh, that will pay you some R, uh, R tilde or some uh, uncertain prospect. Now, when you invest in sort of uh, risky assets, it's typically a group of risky assets or not just one risky asset, but a sort of a portfolio of risky assets. And essentially, the, uh, it comprises of different securities. So suppose that you can invest in N risky securities with re varying returns. So for example, uh, security one would have this rate of return, security two, like for example, say Apple stock has this rate of return, Google stock has this rate of return, and Tesla has this rate of return, and so on. These securities have different and varying rates of return. And essentially, what we do is to modify uh, this part here, essentially by just saying, okay, that uh, that alpha, you invest it in risky securities, but then there are multiple risky securities that you can allocate wealth in. So AI is the alpha I is the amount that you invest in a particular security, wherein you have here, uh, you, you invest it in a total of N securities, that's the sum of it all, times the expected rate of return, specifically less the risk-free rate. And that, um, that will be the change that will happen to this particular formula. So if you recall, uh, I'm sorry, if not you recall, we can transform this particular equation here or this particular expression into this form here. So pay close attention to this term that we have here. Uh, we have here uh, xi times w naught. Okay, so xi, okay, we denote xi as alpha i all over w naught. So Alpha I is the amount you invest uh, invest in risky security uh, uh, particular I, a particular risky security. And W naught is your total investable wealth, right? Essentially, XI is just the proportion of your total investable wealth that you invested in a particular risky prospect, right? So it's the proportion, so it's some value between zero and one, it's a proportion of alpha i divided by w naught. You have varying uh, alpha i's, mind you, because you have different securities. So as I said, xi is equal to alpha i over w naught. It's the proportion of wealth invested 
in the risky security eye. So in this formulation, the security selection problem, which is to select the optimal proportion of wealth invested in each risky asset XI is embedded in the portfolio allocation problem. Essentially, we're just adding this part of the problem of trying to determine, okay, what is the optimal proportion that we're going to have? Note that uh, if XI is equal to alpha I over W naught, then it also holds that alpha I is equal to XI times W naught. So it fits in perfectly with our formula. So this is alpha I, right? And that's essentially the formula which we had in the last slide. Okay, so moving on. In the overall portfolio though, the total amount of wealth invested in risky assets is alpha. So as I said, W naught is your total investable wealth. You could invest it in a risk-free security or risk-free environment and the amount that you would invest in that is one minus alpha. Then you could also invest in a risky security or in risky securities rather, a group of securities. And the total amount of that is equal to alpha, right? The, that's what you invest in the risky securities. So you'll know that if you sum up, okay, if you sum up all the alpha i's, right? If I sum that up, this is essentially equal to your initial wealth times the sum of all uh, your shares of uh, alpha i. And this means that essentially it's al uh, alpha is equal to W naught times the sum of the uh, all the individual security shares, right? So this is xi. So if I sum up all of the XI, remember XI constitutes with the proportion of uh, your investable wealth you invest in the risky prospect. Uh, you expect that probably XI would be some, va this entire value here, right? That uh, entire box there would be some value probably less than one, right? Because it's unlikely that the consumer would be willing to invest his entire uh, uh, investable wealth in a risky prospect. So sum of XI is likely somewhere less than one. And if you multiply that quantity, which is something less than one times W naught, it gives you alpha, which is the amount, okay, in dollars or in pesos that you allocated to the risky security, right? So thus the peso amount invested in the risk-free asset is essentially, uh, remember, alpha is the amount that you invest in the risky asset, right? So that's the risky asset. Therefore, the amount that you invest in the risk-free asset is essentially W naught minus alpha, right? W naught minus alpha, right? And you have this one, which is, uh, and you can sort of calculate it here as just this particular form there, right? And it makes sense. Whatever you don't invest in a risky asset, you invest in a risk-free asset, right? Because that's the simple purport, uh, that's a simple allocation problem for this particular consumer. So the proportion of W naught invested in the risk-free asset is essentially this, right? W naught minus alpha is amount invested, invested in risk-free, risk-free asset. Then W naught is total investable wealth. If I divide the two, I will get this particular expression here, which is one less the sum of all the proportions of xi, noting that xi is the sum of all the share. I'm sorry, uh, the sum of xi is the sum of all the shares of uh, your investable wealth that you invested in the risky asset. And using this simple formulation, you can rewrite the portfolio problem as just this uh, uh, thing here, which is the, uh, the expected utility is equal to u w naught times one plus the risk. Uh, the, uh, the rate of return of the overall portfolio of assets. So R tilde is now some uh, representation of the overall rate of return, wherein you have risk free, wherein some of it you allocated to risk free security, some of it you allocated to risky securities. So clearly, the overall rate of return, right, which is R tilde, so this is your overall, okay, overall rate of return right, can simply be expressed as RF, right, RF, uh, which is the risk-free rate, plus, okay, the sum 
of all the shares, uh, of all xi shares or proportions times ri tilde minus rf. Now, this thing here, it may be positive or negative, right? If it so happens that majority of your uh, individual rate of returns for the securities is lower than the risk fee rate, then certainly this entire part could potentially be negative. But in um, as, as we'd like to assume in most cases, we think that the rate of return, if we're trying to make a conscious and uh, utility maximizing investment, then we will see that the decision will be made for as long as the rate of return of an individual security is higher than the risk-free rate. And if we sort of expound this, this will be equal to one minus sum of i equal to one to n x i times r f. So remember, this is the um, um, this is the proportion of the wealth uh, which you invest in the risk-free uh, asset. Then this is the proportion of the wealth you invest in uh, the risky asset, and you're going to multiply it by their specific rate of return, right? So. In essence, we transformed what was the whole case, which is in this one. Uh, th this is a sort of whole case into rates of return, right? As we done in the past lecture. So with an appropriate redefinition of the utility function, the portfolio problem can be equivalently written as the form that we have here below. Right? So it can be written as the expected utility of W naught which is your total investable wealth uh, times one plus R tilde, which is equal to U hat. Right? In all of these cases, the decision variables that you have are portfolio proportions XI. So how much are you going to invest uh, as a proportion of your total investable wealth into risky securities? And it also shows that the above analysis shows that utility may be equivalently defined as a function of the overall portfolio's rate of return. So the level of investable wealth, W0, becomes a parameter of the utility representation. So uh, given the equivalence of the portfolio problems using the raw amounts and the rates of return, what we'll do is we can work with the utility function defined over the portfolio's rate of return. And it's easier to think about things in terms of rate of return. Just like when you're looking at the plan investment, it's easier to look at the rate of return rather than looking at raw amounts, right? So that's much easier for an investor to understand. And what we're going to sort of discuss in the upcoming video is that this particular expected utility index or representation can be further constrained to be a function of the mean and variance or the standard deviation of the probability distribution of the rate of return. And this is where the mean variance criterion in finance typically comes in. So that's what we're gonna do in uh, the next video, which is the mean variance expected utility hypothesis. Uh, I'll end this video here. Thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.